What do you anticipate yeah. in, in the days, if not weeks ahead, for, for the market, specifically tech, and whether you think there's going to be um, you know, con some con continued damage there, whether some of the money comes out and goes into cyclical names, as, as we've heard some suggest you should be looking to do? Well, look, I'm, I'm going to talk about it from a stock picker's perspective. I think everybody just gave a great strategic overview. Uh, I'm going to play a little small ball here. I'm going to tell you what I think you should avoid and, and where I think the opportunities are. First off, in, in large cap tech, and just take Apple as an example, I think Apple's perfectly safe. At 30 times forward multiples in a 0.7% 10-year uh, treasury world, I, I don't blink an eye at that. So, you know, when we're talking about Apple, Microsoft, even NVIDIA, those don't scare me. Where I think there's some air pockets that still may form are the new economy stocks which are great companies but which are up sixfold in the case of zoom or fivefold in the case of tesla and you know valuations are not just unseen they're obscene so th those i think are susceptible <laughs> to profit taking now in terms of where i would put the money to work as you see maybe some money coming out of those high flyers it's not just the Apples, the Googles, it's maybe the NVIDIAs of the world. Maybe, uh, you know, I did add to Visa last week and I've got my eye on Salesforce. On the other side of the equation in the cyclicals, I think you've still got to stay away from energy and financials. There's just, even though I own some of them, it's hard to make a compelling case. But you know where it is easy to make a compelling case is the industrials. And I don't know if anybody's missed this, but the industrials are on fire. You look at companies like Caterpillar breaking out. It's at a 52-week high. It wants to set a three-year high here. General Motors, forget where the price is. The underlying fundamentals of car sales and car prices are terrific. So you can look at industrials. Uh, for opportunities if you don't just want to stay in tech. Josh, I know you're thinking a lot about this. So now, right, we, we know you sold, you sold Slack, right? If I recall, you no longer own Zoom. Am I, am I right about that? No, I took my original cost. My original cost average was in the 70s pre-pandemic. So I took those dollars out. I have the house's money on the line here. I don't recommend that investors invest that way, but Zoom was always a trade for me. It worked out way better than I ever could have imagined, but I wanted my principal back out. So, but I'm I'm still there. Okay, um, but certainly not in the way you were before. What about Teladoc? Actually, no, Scott. More than before, if you if you buy a stock at seventy that goes to, you know, three hundred or whatever, and you take out your original cost, um, the shares you're still left with are worth more than what you started with. So I'm still there. It still matters to me. What about Teladoc? No position. But you used to, radar. but, but you did, right but now. you did have, you did have a position there, right? Yeah. So let, check this out. I will only look. I will only. You know where ever I'm going with this, right? You, you know, you, have, you understand have, where have, I'm going yeah. with this, right? Uh, totally. I will only ever personally put on concentrated positions in stocks with betas of 1.7. You know, high momentum, high flyer, high octane uh, stocks. I will only ever be able to mentally handle a few of them at a time you will never see a homie like me with like 12 of these things ricocheting off the walls i'm not i'm not trying to turn my portfolio into a pinata party so i've been in many of these high octane names i can't be in all of them at once and i don't believe that five years from now any of them will even be in the conversation uh, most of them will even be in the conversation they're not all going to turn into google and apple and i hope people understand that you can't fall in love with your stocks because they disappear all the time. So right now, I'm in CrowdStrike. I'm not in Slack. I'm not in Teladoc. I'm in Zoom. I can't own them all. It's, it's, too, it's too much, too much agita. I'm 43 years old. I have other things that I'm focused on. <laughs> I, I think we're all trying to figure out um, you know, what to own, what not to own, kind of where we are and where we, where we may be going. And, and one well-known market watcher says the NASDAQ 100 right now, which is full of, you know, some of the big names, obviously, that we're talking about, is an ominous company. Those are his words. Let's bring in Jonathan Krinsky. He's the chief market technician at Baycrest Partners, joins us once again. Jonathan, welcome back. Thanks, Scott. Good what, to be here. Ominous company, how? Well, what we had coming off the highs uh, a couple days ago, we saw a three-day decline in the NASDAQ 100 of minus 8% after hitting a 52-week high. We've only seen that set up five other times in the history of the, of the NASDAQ, back to 1985. Uh, three were in early 2000, one was in November of 07, and then one was recently here in February of, of 2020. Um, so I think what's, what's notable, obviously, those are some ominous dates. 
Um, I think if, if we had to draw any type of analogy, it would be the, the 2000 time frame. But here's what, what I think is important and what gets lost. So when people think of March of 2000, there tends to be this big uh, major top connotations. But it really wasn't a top for, for most stocks. And in fact, and this is what's lost on a lot of people, um, from March of 2000 through the end of the year, there were four sectors that were up 40%. And if you bought the equal weight S&P 500 on, in March of 2000, you actually made 25% over the next year. Take it a step further, there's actually a, an index that's a, re, a reverse cap weight index where the smallest companies in the S&P are given the most weight. So it's completely the opposite of, of the S&P cap weighted index. That actually outperformed the S&P by almost 100% over the next two years. So I think our point here, there are some extreme uh, analogies in the NASDAQ 100 that are, are very analogous to some, some bubble-like periods, but that doesn't mean that the overall market has to, has to be a concern. And we actually think, um, you know, you kind of, there's a lot of talk about this barbell strategy, right, where you're looking at the, um, the COVID names and then the, the uh, reopen plays. But what gets lost is a lot of the names in the middle. So some of the names like uh, the coffee names, Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks, you guys were talking about those, McDonald's, uh, the home builders. A lot of these are kind of in that middle where they're not the high-flying tech names, they're not the, you know, the banks or the energy sector. So I think that's where you kind of want to focus right now. But, I mean, you, you say it, you know, this is not necessarily a sign that the overall market may, may be in peril, but you're not suggesting that the NASDAQ couldn't have more room to go to the downside. I mean, you yeah, we, throw out some ominous that, dates, right? I mean, it's not like we, one or we, two we, dates. It's like five dates, and everybody knows what happened around all of those instances. Yeah, well, well let's be clear. If we're talking about the NASDAQ 100, it's more concentrated now at the top six names than it was at the peak in 2000. Six names represent about half the index. So, the, you know, the names you talk about, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, you know, we do think there's some downside risk there. And even after the pullback we've just seen in NASDAQ 100, we're still 21% above the 200-day moving average. Let's put that in perspective. Outside of the July-August move of this year, that is still one of the most extreme spreads versus the 200 day that we've seen in the last 30 years. So yes, we think there is risk in those big mega cap names, but like we've seen throughout other times in history, there are plenty of other names below the surface that can do well despite those maybe seeing some, some profit taking. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not like it was no seven where, where, you know, a lot of sectors continue to deteriorate and there was really no place to hide. Uh, we do think it's more like that late 90s period where um, just certain areas of the market got a little bit extended, but there's other areas that uh, can certainly be played uh, for the long side. Not to minimize it at all, though. I mean, this is a big area of the market that you're suggesting may be overextended. So, well, Jenny, well, that's, go, yeah, go, I'm one, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, that, that is a good point. And, you know, given the concentration of those top names, that they are, in fact, a bigger weight than they were in 2000, if, if we see further selling there, it's going to be almost impossible for the S&P 500 to, to make meaningful upside progress. So it, it's, it could be a situation where, um, you know, the, the passive plays where you're in these, in these uh, cap-weighted ETFs actually, actually do go down, but the average stock may, in fact, um, be flat to higher. And that's exactly what we saw in the, uh, in the last three quarters of 2000. So, you know, Jenny, you, you hear what Jonathan is saying, and, and look, he's not the only one. Sam Stovall is out today saying the S&P 500 decline could double before the pullback is over. If you have large upset within this concentrated area of the market, it's going to be awfully hard to keep those winds from blowing a lot of other stocks over. Maybe, but what the point that he made at the very end was really critical, which is that the stocks in the middle could actually could actually have positive returns while the top part of the market comes down. And that is exactly what we saw in 2000. While the, while the high growth trade collapsed, the value part actually did really, really well. So you, know, so you could have a lot of winners out there. Um, Josh brought up a really interesting point too as we're thinking about this, which is be careful of, of falling in love because some stocks will disappear. I think that's true. But I also think that there's tr a tremendous amount of stocks out there that won't disappear, that have really significant cash flows that have been lost in the shuffle of our love affair with you know, growth at any price. And we've been ignoring the fact that things like Slack and CrowdStrike and Tesla and DocuSign and Peloton, we've been ignoring the fact that those guys don't have earnings, right? So those with earnings and those with cash flows could start to actually perform quite well, to Jonathan's point about the, the 
rest of the market making up making up for the top part that backs off. Josh, t time to worry. Are, are these are the you know the storm clouds getting a little too ominous now, or what? Uh, I just I just go back to this idea that the way you orient a portfolio should be based around what it's realistic for you to do as an investor. I see a lot of people like looking at technical breakouts and this and that, and I'm like, what What do you do for like What do you do for a living? What do you do all day? They're like, oh, um, I I own an orthodontistry practice. Really? And you're trading on technicals? How exactly does that work? You prop the phone up next to the patient's mouth. Uh, that's an investment strategy that requires constant, constant. Even if you have alerts set or you have price targets um, in an algorithm or whatever, that re re requires constant monitoring. If you're the kind of investor, though, who's setting up dividend reinvestment portfolios and buying a lot of the Jenny stocks, which, by the way, I love those stocks, that requires much less. You Forget about ominous storm clouds. Nobody has any idea what the market's going to do. Krinsky will tell you, those five dates he picked out, that's out of like 100 years of market history. So uh, it's not a really big sample size. It's a sample within a sample that's not even that big. Give me a thousand years of market data, then I'll tell you you're no, a scientist. No, but I mean, when, when right you now. say, <laughs> well, when you say, and I'll, Jonathan Krinsky, I'll, I'll give you a chance to respond I was on to a, that. I was on a huge roll here, Judge. Go ahead. Which is why I had to jump in when I did. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> Krinsky goes on to say, in the, I mean, it's not insignificant data, right? In the history of the NDX back to 1985, we have only seen it lose 8% or more over three sessions immediately following a 52-week high five other times. You don't need to have 100 years worth of history to have the instances that he cites. Jonathan, I'll hand the ball to you. You run with it now. Well, yeah, I think, you know, look, the pushback, you, you could have made a lot of extreme cases at any point in August, right? We've been talking about how stretched the NASDAQ was. Um, and you could have said, well, it's different this time. Interest rates are different, et cetera. But the reality is it was different this time, but yet we still lost almost the entire month of gains in August in three days. So that just shows you the power that these names have. Um, now, to, to Josh's point, we, it is a small sample size. We're not saying that's going to happen, but we are saying that when you see something that can lose a month of gains in three days, that tells you that there is, it, it's not this safety trade that uh, we think a lot of people perceive uh, FANG and the mega, tech, mega cap techs to be. They, they do have risk, and we're still 20% above the 200-day, which, again, outside of the last month and a half, would still be one of the most extreme stretches we've had in 30 years. Yeah, and it may, look, it, it may Scott. not be, the, the alarm bells may not be loudest, Josh, around the the big five or, or fang or the largest mega cap name names in in the lights maybe the alarm bells are are going off the loudest for the cloud flares and i'm looking at my list of you know stocks that have pulled back a lot which have been up huge shopify and square and twilio and slack and fastly and tesla and docusign and zoom and maybe where some of this new money quote unquote from robin hood and elsewhere um, had flooded into, you know, how much Robin Hood money was flowing into a lot of the mega cap names. Maybe it, maybe it was a substantial amount, but maybe more of it was going into the more speculative plays and some of the names that I just read out that we've talked about on this program. So it's probably not new money. It's probably margin and options leverage. But I want to leave that aside. Even I, worse. I agree with what Jonathan had <laughs> to say. Even worse. And, but if you're, if, you're, if you're being reasonable and honest with yourself, then you're saying yes. These stocks, these, let's say, 50 to 100 stocks that we talk about relentlessly, they had been incredibly stretched into the end of August. Let's all, uh, first week of September. Let's all concede that. Okay, nobody would argue otherwise. But the thing is, many of them had also been incredibly stretched in July, in June, in May. And this idea of losing a month's worth of stock market performance in three days, well, we lost almost two years' worth of stock market performance in 16 days um, in, in March and April, and these stocks came ripping back. So I don't know that that's the type of market action that we want to then say has a cause effect on what happens next, because well, historically it really doesn't. I Last thing, Look, we, unprecedented the, stuff the, the happens reason, all the time. You can, you can say that this time was different from what we witnessed in March and April. We, we pulled back in the magnitude in which we did over those 16 days because we had a once-in-100-year event uh, inflict 
the the the, the economy, the market, so, health care, so, hold on, hold on, of Krinsky, our citizens. Kr hold on, Krinsky, tell Scott what uh, the ten-year Treasury was yielding um, back in in 2000. Those ominous dates that you're talking about. What were you able to get on on a yield if you sold out of your your stocks? Oops. Well, back Josh, in May of 2000, or whatever those dates Josh, were. Josh, that's my point. If 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 I was on the, if I came to you last week and said, the Nasdaq's about to do something that it's only done in 2000, you could say, well, it can't do that yeah. because interest rates are different, and it just did it. So that's my point. Um, one other thing I'll say, you know, the with the pullback and snapback in March, that was coming at, from Apple being below its 200-day moving average. It's still. You know, massively above its 200 days. So again, this is not uh, saying the end of the run by any means. It's just saying think of think of the risk in some of these big mega cap names, and don't be surprised if some of the middle ground stocks that we that don't get talked about as much actually outperform in the coming months. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see where the money goes. I, I agree with all that. Yep, Jonathan, we love the conversation. Thank you for sharing it with us. We'll talk to you Thanks, soon. Guys. All right, that's Jonathan Krinsky. Of course, there's Tom Lee. There always is Tom Lee with an opinion on the market. Most of them have been right of late. And today he is saying, let's not forget, mm -hmm. Fed put equals buy the dip. Ultimately, if the Fed is dovish, monetary policy is easy. Markets have a backstop. We must still buy the dip. He also thinks there is better risk reward now in the epicenter stocks, as he's made that case numerous times, not only in print, but on this program, thinks you should own the cyclical names. Jenny, to your point, that works. Only if you have money that comes out of tech and goes into cyclical stocks and people feel comfortable to go there. Let's take a quick that's break. That's not exactly true. Okay, go go ahead quickly. Just <laughs> there's ahead. been tremendous bond in, bond. There's been tremendous inflows into bonds. If you want to know where money can come from, I mean, it's just huge. It's been like hundreds of billions of dollars this year. That's money that can and should come out from low yielding securities into the stock market as it corrects. Okay. All right. Good point. Okay. Good point. We will take that quick break. A historic day on the street. City naming its first female CEO. It's also the, also the first time a woman will become head of a major U.S. bank. It's a big deal. We're going to talk about that. Debate the financials next on The Half. And a reminder, you can always watch or listen to us live on the go on the CNBC app. We're back after this. Let's talk about some of the moves you're making. Um, what's going on? What are you doing? Scott, I exited Sonos, S-O-N-O, -O, um, just did because, you know, the thing hadn't been moving and some of the calls that I was long in there were getting, were shrinking. So I said, I'll hit the exits. Um, took some profits on AMD uh, that we did for Unusual Activity Tuesday this week, Scott. I was long, long calls and short puts. Uh, this one rallied significantly. Um, we had a nice trade yesterday, Scott, in one of Josh Brown's favorite stocks, Shake Shack. Um, at the money calls <laughs> yesterday, the 67s that expire tomorrow, uh, Friday the 11th, those calls were accumulated in big numbers yesterday. They went $5 in the money today, Scott. Traded from 67 to 72 and change. Um, and I've been hitting the exits on those throughout the day. Uh, like you already said, Tesla. We uh, bought some Too on early. the dip. We'll see how well that holds up. But uh, a lot of uh, short-term trading, Scott, most of it dated mm -hmm. within the next 30 days, some of it just in days, as in two days, till uh, tomorrow's expiration. Sounds like we're going to have a debate for a moment, at least uh, on Shake Shack. John, um, I think, okay. I don't know, did you, just hear, did you just hear Josh? I think, Josh, you're calling Shake Shack too early to make that move? Uh, I was just teasing the shark. Uh, I don't want to get too close to the shark. <laughs> Seriously, though, I mean, you've made the case, uh, I, I, Josh. Josh, I, you've made the case on 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 this program. It's options. He has no. Ch yeah, but he's he's doing options. He has. It's well, options he's defining is, is he's obviously right defining his risk. Yeah. Well, you have to be right on the timing. The difference between me and John, I can sit forever and eventually be right. John's got John's leaking gamma and theta out of his ears. He's got to make a move. So he's probably doing the right thing. I hear you. But the, the, the thesis, if you will, is, is maybe a little bit different, right? I, I get that John's doing this for a trade. I don't want to put words in your mouth, John, but maybe you're, right. you're more optimistic about what you think Shake Shack's exploits are going forward, even you know, at a time where, Josh, you, you've been a little more cautious on that name due to the pandemic I and mean, some of the you know, more obvious reasons that you've stated, lack of drive-through and, and things like that that the company is, is working on. Am I right? 
Yeah. Oh, look, the stock's um, up 100% yeah. from the March low. I didn't, I didn't expect that rebound. Um, John is, is uh, involved in Shaq as a trade. I'm involved in Shake Shack as a lifestyle. It's a little bit different. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. Doc. And uh, <laughs> I, I give Josh full credit, too, Scott. I mean, um, he's been a bird dog on this name, just like Jim has been on Roku. And uh, Jenny has been on numerous stocks. Jim doesn't um, even own Roku anymore. I just anymore. like this one. No, <laughs> oh, I know, but he was Scotty, a bird dog. Scotty. He was in there. He was, Scotty, I did He was too. flushing those. You, it back? you missed it. <laughs> Yeah, you were on vacation. I actually <laughs> tweeted at you, but come to think of it, I saw no response. You'll never get away from it, Jim. It was about a week and a <laughs> I don't know how yeah, much I looked. Yeah, I know. I know. Listen. <laughs> I don't know how much I looked at Twitter Listen, when I, I was on I vacation. Said Purposely. I can't blame you. <laughs> you weren't Don't. watching to see what I was doing. No, I bought it about a week and a half ago, Scotty, because uh, it's playing some catch-up to the rest of the NASDAQ, uh, and it's got some room to run. But it's a trade. I'm not even I'm not even remotely trying to value it. Look, it's a good stay-at-home stock. People need their TVs. You get a new TV, it's going to come with Roku, unless you're a dinosaur. Yeah, but, you know, now I feel like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth on this one now, Jim. I mean... <laughs> it's been a good stay-at-home play. There's, that's been undeniable, but you've made the case throughout the pandemic at, at, at various points, not just one point, at various points, exactly what you just said, that you can't value it, so you're not going to play in it at all at this point. So you are correct that I have changed my tune. Let me be specific. Beginning of this year, I said I'm not trading it anymore. Now, when I bought it, I said I'm changing my tune. I'm making a trade because I see it catching up with the rest of the stay-at-home stocks. If you actually look at the chart, I mean, it's actually massively unperformed any of the other stay-at-home or NASDAQ stocks. So it's got some catch-up to do. But listen, I was up front. You weren't here, and I'm telling you now. I was up front and saying, yeah, I said I wasn't going to trade it, and now I'm back in it. Look, times change. you got to change with them. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's an historic. I'm not allowed to change my mind. You I mean, are look, if, if I dogmatically. Well, you, you are a lot to, allowed to change your mind, but I mean, you know, when you make a when you when you make the case that you know, okay, you you trade in and out of this name, and principally you you say on on the air, um, I'm done with this thing because you know I can't value it. And now you've, you're, you're back into it saying, well, I can't value I it, but it's a good... It. What? I never could value it. This was never a valuation game. But one never of the reasons why you said you were done with it, one of the principal, if not <laughs> singular reason you said that you were done with it was because you could just couldn't value it and you weren't going to play that game anymore. No, 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 no. no. You're, I'm sorry. That's not correct. The reason that I got out of it was because it lost its momentum. You know, remember, this was a stock that would go up threefold in a year, and that's the sort of momentum that you could ride. I never, ever have said you could value this thing. However, I believe, and Bob whether Pisani I'm right or wrong ETF is to be determined, I, be, I believe that the momentum has come back to it to catch up with the rest of the NASDAQ names. Now, that's the trade. Valuation has never come into this. Uh, and oh, we'll see that. if I'm right or wrong. It's relatively new. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Up next, the big ETFs to watch today and today at 2. CNBC's Inclusion in Action Forum examines how business leaders can take immediate concrete action addressing racial disparities in their organizations and create sustainable solutions to allow for equity and opportunity for all. So yeah, let's start with Adobe. RBC reiterating its outperform rating. Target goes to 550 bucks, and this is largely on improving demand. You can see the stock is up about 1.2%. Wedbush adding Bed Bath & Beyond to its best ideas list. Price target $18. They say the company is in the midst of a dramatic improvement in profitability. They expect that to continue. The stock, however, still has a long way to go. It's down about 30% this year. And then take a look at shares of RH, up 23% and hitting a new all-time high today after smashing earnings estimates Telsey also upgrading the stock on continued strong demand and higher price margins. Price target here, Scott, goes to 450 bucks. By the way, the CEO of RH, he's going to be joining Jim Cramer tonight on Mad Money, so watch for that. Scott. And we definitely will. Rahel, thank you very much. Jenny, you would rather own Sherwin-Williams than RH, though I know you wish you owned RH today. <laughs> I do wish I owned it today, but I love those companies that just pump out super consistent cash flow and you don't have any worry about the fickle emotional response of people and what they're going to do at any one time. You're always going to need to paint your walls. You may or may not be inspired to redecorate your home. So. All right. 
Time for the futures outlook now. Silver is up more than 50% this year. Our next guest says more gains are coming. Jeff Kilberg of KKM Financial joins us. Where's it going then? Well, Judge, I think it's going higher. And certainly we saw a parabolic move in the month of July. It's cooled off a little bit here in August. And now I want to have a buy on the December silver futures. I want to be a buy right here at 27.25 with a target, Scott, of 28.50. I'm being mindful. 50 cents lower, I want to put a stop at 26.75. So I'm risking 2,500 bucks to make 62.50 as it's $50 per penny here. But the reason, I'm not going to give you all the reasons. You don't know all the reasons why precious metals are being bought, Scott, right? We have the weaker dollar. We have Fed policy. I want to talk technicals. We actually own silver because of the technical strength above the 50-day moving average. It's on its way to revisit that high and put on August 7th of 30 bucks. All right. Good stuff. We'll see you soon, Jeff. Thank you. That's Jeff Kilberg. Final trades after this quick break. John, let's do unusual before we go. All right, Scott. Uh, both of them luxury plays, Scott. Uh, first one, Tapestry, used to be known as Coach. They're buying the SEP 15 calls. These calls expire next Friday, Scott. They're paying about 50 to 60 cents for those. Second trade, they uh, basically run the brands Jimmy Choo, Versace, a whole bunch of others. That's Capri. Um, this one also September expiration next week, Scott. They're buying the 1850 calls, which are in the money. Stocks made a nice run today. I'm in both of these, and I'll probably be out by the middle to tail end of next week, Scott. Okay, good stuff. Do you have a final trade for us as well, Doc? Sure. Uh, plug, P-L-U-G. This one is just seeing explosive volume right now in the September 13 calls. I bought those. Okay, good triple from you there. Thank you for that. Uh, Jim Laban, Thank you, sir. What do you have for us today? Yeah, Citigroup uh, named a new uh, CEO, and it's a woman. This is a great idea. There's going to need to be a lot of outreach from the bank to society, and this shows they are in touch with the modern world. I think it's terrific. Yeah, congrats to Jane Fraser uh, on her big day. Big day for everybody, really. Jenny, what do you have for us? In honor of the NFL returning tonight, Viacom CBS. I bought it in May. While it's nearly doubled, it's still cheap at six times earnings with a 3% yield. Okay, Josh Brown, quickly from you. Verizon, 4% yield, still long. All right, good stuff. Thanks, everybody. The exchange starts now.